Wow. 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 That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing and your work and your passion and for changing. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Horvath. I'm the founder of Invisible People that now has a brand new tagline, Transformational Storytelling Organization. Thank you. And um, I'm also uh, the CMO of the Rescue Mission Alliance, and I'm really grateful to be here. And I have to say, a little nervous, because you guys, you're like the top. You're the best of the best, and for the last month, Oh my gosh, every spare moment I've been researching and getting stock photos. I even hired a virtual assistant to help me research. And oh my gosh, I just, I just, if I can leave every one of you with just one idea, it was so important. And I submitted 82 slides. And Derek immediately said, no, that's too much. That's too much. And he immediately started cutting them down. So I think we're only at 79. And for the next six hours, I want to talk to you about, no, really, just a short talk. But on the same subject, um, I had some slides of my visit to southern Sudan because I wanted to connect with you guys and say, hey, I'm one of you. Back in 2003 and 2005, I was the lead producer on a campaign and produced direct response television in southern Sudan that raised lots and lots of money. So Derek took those slides out, and the first thing this morning he says, I want you to talk about Sudan. So a little bit of, you know, here and there and everything else. So Invisible People is a storytelling organization that really just, it wasn't something that I thought I was gonna do. A lot of people say they're called. I'm called to this ministry, I'm called to this charity, I'm called to this work, and that's great. But for me, I've always felt if I'm called, I can hang up the phone. I've been forced, for the next little bit, I'll just do a case study, and I have just been forced into this work, and it has changed my life, and I am really actually very grateful. So I don't know about you, but I said I would never Twitter. I said I would never use social media. I thought social media was dumb. However, every photo of me, pretty much even down here, I'm tweeting away, is me on social media Twittering. That's the Los Angeles Times. I also said I'd never be homeless. Now, I'm lucky that when I hit the streets of Los Angeles, Hollywood Boulevard, that there wasn't a camera on every phone. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of really funky photos of me. So this is me, and that's Dog, my six-foot iguana, and literally homeless on Hollywood Boulevard. Now, to explain the story a little more, before that, I had a director-level position in the television industry. I helped the world get Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, Married with Children, a bunch of shows. It was the manufacturing end of television. So never met Vanna White, didn't go to all the parties, made a lot of money, a lot of stress, a lot of work, drugs, alcohol, ended up on the streets. A little brief fundraising story. So here I am, I'm on Hollywood Boulevard. I come from the television industry. Don't know how to survive. So used to be, now there's a wax museum. Used to be a, a, a wall with a t-shirt shop. So I'm literally sitting with my hands and my, my head in my hands and the iguana on my shoulder, trying to figure out how am I gonna survive? How am I gonna live as a homeless person? There's no guide, there's no manual. And all of a sudden a busload of tourists pulled up and they circled around me and they said, can we take a picture of your iguana? And I'm still down like this, and I said, yeah, for a dollar. I look up, and they're all handing out dollars. 
So I became the lizard man of Hollywood Boulevard. And literally, that's what Los Angeles Police Department used to call me. I rebuilt my life back to a three-bedroom house and nice, cushy job, marketing. The economy tanked. And I lost everything again except my sobriety. Right around 19 months of unemployment, I grabbed the camera, not consecutively, I'd get a job for a month and get laid off and get a job for a month. It was a really dark time. And right around 19 months of unemployment, I grabbed the camera, backpack, still travel with a backpack full of socks, iPhone, and I started storytelling, started empowering homeless people to share their own story. And if I can leave you with one thing, I didn't have any resources except a bag of socks, an iPhone, and a camera. So I took $45, I hacked out a WordPress blog, registered a domain, and started invisiblepeople.tv. And I started to travel. I started traveling, empowering homeless people to tell their own stories. So one of the things Derek let me add back in is a short story, short video to show you, highlight my work. And the back story of this is I just landed at Heathrow in London. I was jet lagged through from Los Angeles. I was amazingly tired. Last thing I wanted to do was work. Last thing I wanted to do was even talk to somebody. But I started walking down the street, pouring rain, and here was that girl, and let me introduce you to Natasha. Right, so are you gonna ask me questions? Yeah. Okay. Natasha. Yeah. You're homeless in London. I am. It's raining out. It is. Where are you gonna sleep? On the streets, unless I make 24 pounds. And what's 24 pounds gonna get you? Gets a hostel for the night. Uh, it, 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 hostels cost? Hostels cost, yeah, unless you get a hostel from the council. Oh, so then the council pays for it? Yep. Um, my gosh, and you've got crutches? Yeah, I caught step to see me off from sleeping on the streets. And now how long have you been homeless? I've been homeless for four years. Four years out here? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't there any help? I've tried everything, charities, everything, but I'm not a drug addict, I'm not an alcoholic, and I'm not pregnant. And they're the three things that get you help. So, not being any of them, I don't, I don't, I don't fit for a charity. Right. Yeah. So how do you survive? Day by day, just hoping that people will help me. I don't get no benefits, and I think. Wow. Yeah. Um, what's your future like? I want to be a writer. I want to write fiction. You do? Yes. Not true life. I don't want to depress people. <laughs> well, you, you still have a great smile. Thank you. So, and um, uh, what are you doing to, are you writing? What are you? I write every day. I write every single day. Well, yeah. great. Yeah. I've been in hospital. I was in hospital for like three and a half weeks. Okay. So, um, I did a lot of writing. <laughs> wow. Uh, if you had three wishes, what would they be? What would they be? Right. Just to have somewhere to live. Just, just the tiniest little place to me would be a palace. <laughs> um, to be able to get my leg better now so that I can get a job. And basically, to be looked at like a person a lot of the time. Well, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. So overnight, this video shot on a phone, pretty much zero production value, had 169,000 views. And it started a conversation about welfare reform in the UK that was absolutely brilliant. So I don't know what resources you have. Authenticity has replaced production value. We all carry this thing in our pocket, phone, connected to everybody else, and we literally can change the world. 
when I first started, I thought I was a little crazy. Still think I'm a little crazy. And, um, you know, here I am, raw, unedited video. I'm a television producer. That doesn't make any sense. And this is America's Next Top Model. And this is their forum. And a girl wrote, I was taught to call people bums, to ignore them, to be afraid of them. And because of invisible people, I've learned they're like everyone else. They need help not to be ignored. So I started getting little nuggets that it's starting to change people's perceptions. So I kept going. Los Angeles Fire Department. Now these guys aren't just getting cats out of the trees. It's a city of 15 million people, all kinds of crisis going on. These guys are real heroes. Mark. You humble us to the point our eyes leak. You're among the greatest examples that any of us could follow. Now, I just want to put this in perspective. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm trying to show influence. Here, all I have is a bag of socks, an iPhone, and a camera. And one of the biggest fire departments in the world has encouraged me, keep going, keep going. So I started to travel. In fact, the first couple of road trips, when I left Los Angeles, I didn't know if I'd make it back. But thanks to all of you guys on social media, I was not only made, able to make it back, I was able to affect a lot of change. In 2011, the Canadian government actually invited me to go to 24 cities in Canada. So I left Los Angeles and drove around. And interesting enough, I also said I would never drive long distance. Um, I've now been to seven countries. I stopped counting cities around 200 cities a few years ago. And one of the most special moments, MenCap in the UK brought me to teach their staff and their clients social media. So being a, teaching people with learning disabilities social media was just a highlight of my life. Uh, this is Nancy Pelosi up on the left. She's the Speaker of the House at the time, which is, you know, a rung below the President of the United States. And that's me on the right, photoshopped. Now again, you know, in the States at least, homelessness, rough sleeping, isn't sexy unless it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or some holiday the rest of the time. And here I'm an old, fat, loud guy with a bag of socks and an iPhone, and I'm being photoshopped on, on paper, and this is actually the home of Walmart in Bentonville, which has a lot of influence on the world's economy. My iPhone sunk to the Ford Motor Company website. So for two years, when I took a photo or I did a video like Natasha, one of the largest automobile manufacturers in the world put that content up on their website. I've done several projects with Ford since then. General Motors did a big event in Chicago, lent me a car for a year. Murphy Oil lent gas for a year. Now Hanes, which is a clothing manufacturer in the States, literally gave me socks so I would shut up and go away. Stop bothering us, here's some socks. Now. Over the last several years, we've given millions and millions of pairs through the Salvation Army to people sleeping rough. And this last year, not this last December, the December prior, we did a campaign that reached 132 million people in the month of December. What's really interesting about this campaign is the story of homeless people. It's not about Haynes, and it's not about me, and it's not about socks. It's the story of people that are living on the streets of New York City, and that's what the campaign, what, what people generated and why it went viral. Several big American brands have put my videos on their website. One of the things that I want to tell is share. Don't have your content like this. Make it shareable so people can embed on their websites. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has talked about my work. On August 22nd, 2010, YouTube gave me their homepage for a day. For 24 hours, YouTube let me curate the content on their homepage. 1.6 million people who would have never rolled down their window to talk to a rough sleeper, to talk to somebody in homelessness, had a positive experience of homelessness. Just really amazing. This last year, I was grateful to be invited to YouTube, 
be able to speak to their employees and to have some of my content played to all their employees. So Google's blogged about me a couple of times. That's almost as good as being in the Bible. And uh, they contacted me and said, would you record some videos to play for President Obama? And of course I said yes. And what was really cool about this is it wasn't by Google, it wasn't by me. They really wanted our president to listen to some people experiencing poverty. Um, remember how I said I'd never Twitter? That's me speaking at Twitter. I was the first cause to ever be invited to speak at Twitter. And then this last year, the city of San Francisco invited me and Twitter to Twitter headquarters to speak about homelessness in San Francisco. But this is the stuff I like. There's a tugboat operator in Baton Rouge who said, Brother Mark, there's 50 homeless kids and they don't have any shoes. And within an hour, and all you guys supporting on social media, 50 kids had brand new shoes. This is Don. Don is the first person literally housed because of my work. A farmer donated 40 acres of land. Now, again, I didn't set out and say, okay, I'm going to start this nonprofit and people are going to give land to grow food. That was never, <laughs> never a, a part of the game plan. And again, it's, you know, at this time when all this is happening, bag of socks, a camera, Twitter, social media. So what's really neat about this farm is it feeds 150 people a week, and these are homeless youth that stay in a, in a youth shelter that go and work on the farm. This is Donnie. Donnie was homeless in Calgary, Canada for 21 years. It was so cold that night. I mean, I, at this time I lived in Los Angeles, it was so cold. I was just about ready to beg the outreach team to take me back and we went down one more alley and there was Donnie. And I put up a YouTube video and the Calgary community saw that video and rallied and went and got Donnie into housing. Um, that's happened several times. And what's really neat was during the Canadian road trip, I stopped in to talk to Donnie. This is Terry Pettigrew. Terry Pettigrew was 58 years old living in a homeless shelter. He had been homeless since he was eight years old, 50 years of his life homeless. He's just a wonderful, like, grandfather-type man, just somebody you could sit to talk to. At this time, I was experiencing poverty myself. Why should I keep doing this? I was, you know, the poor me's, poor me. And he was encouraging me, and he's dying of stage four cancer literally dying of stage four cancer in a homeless shelter, encouraging me to keep going. Sometimes it takes me a week, sometimes longer to get a video up, but he so touched my heart, I got the video up that night. And the Calgary newspaper actually put the video on their homepage. And his brother, who he hadn't seen for 33 years, saw the video and they were reunited. And Terry actually got to spend 54 days with family before he passed. This is Kiefer, the, the kid on the side, and this is a homeless family. Literally, there's no water, there's no bathrooms. And Kiefer, how many of you know what a PSP is? It's a little video game. And it's a Sony PSP. So Kiefer bootlegged Wi-Fi from a neighbor. God bless him. And how many of you know who Tony Hawk is? Famous skateboarder, entrepreneur. So Kiefer's mom messaged me on Facebook and said, our son took Tony Hawk's photo off of the video game and put your Facebook photo on there. Well, I'm cool, but I'm not Tony Hawk cool. And somehow Kiefer got onto my Facebook page and he was just like, because PSP is like Netflix or one of those television things where you can't really type. You have to go like this and you can't really do sentences. And so he would leave like, hi, hugs. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Here's this homeless kid and he's just amazing. So I raised the money and I went and visited him and I took the family out to dinner. The uh, Kiefer, this is his first ice cream at Baskin Robbins, and I don't know about you, but I think ice cream and housing should be a human right. Yeah, I agree. 
What's, this is Kiefer. Thank you for everything last night. The best night of my life. Hugs. What's really neat... is this amazing clicker. <laughs> Thank you. Tony Hawk got wind of it. What's up, Kiefer? Please DM me your clothing and shoe size, and I'll send you some stuff. So Tony Hawk immediately sent Kiefer a skateboard. Mom hated it, but I thought it was cool. Bunch of clothes, bunch of shirts, hoodies. And if you're a homeless kid in America, I mean, you have clothes, but you usually have one cool outfit, and you wear it every day, and everybody in school knows you're the homeless kid, and you're not cool because they know you're the homeless kid, and homelessness isn't cool. So here Kiefer comes into school saying, hey, I'm Twittering with Tony Hawk, and they're like, yeah, right, and the next day he comes in with all this autograph stuff. I mean, Kiefer was actually cool for a moment. And speaking of cool... Last year when I was here, um, obviously I don't speak Dutch, and I live in a different time zone. And I started seeing some tweets in Dutch in this time zone about Stratvogels, which translate to street birds. So there's a program here in Amsterdam and four other cities that gives smartphones to homeless people and teaches them how to use social media. What I didn't know is it's based off my work. So last year, after I left the conference, and today I'm going to go be hanging out with them again, um, just truly amazing that something I did with a bag of socks, phone, is having international impact with people on the streets. And one of the most amazing things, another little nugget that I can leave you with is, you know, as nonprofit marketers and nonprofit fundraisers, one of the most important story is the people themselves. If you can empower them to tell their own story, instead of us talking about them, but empower them to tell your own story. Oh my gosh, it's just gorgeous. But this is what social media does to me. I don't know about you, but it just drives me crazy. I mean, oh, everything that's going on today, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, this, that. What do you use? Is it email? Is it direct mail? It just drives me crazy. I just want to eat my tie. So I come today to tell you there's a solution. I'm going to announce something. It's not new, but it's really, really cool. It's really, really great, and it's going to help your fundraising. It's table and two chairs. We need to get back to relationships. And what I'm, this is kind of weird coming from a guy that just talked to you to 10, 15 minutes about digital and the impact of social media. But one thing that I've learned is we, we have gotten a little bit off balance. And when you can get a face-to-face -face conversation or a face-to-face -face connection with somebody, it's so very, very important. So when I was a kid, I was going into a grocery store with my mom, and there was a cute girl sitting on a bench. And I've always been a little girl crazy. So we go in, and I talk my mom into buying me a piece of gum to give her on the way out. So we're walking out, and I don't go over and say hello or anything. I throw the gum at her, and I missed her. It landed on the ground. It was a very embarrassing moment because my mom made me go pick up the gum and hand it to her. But that's what we're doing. So often we're just flying over a city or fly, dropping flyers, hoping it'll reach somebody. You know, we're going, look at me, look at me, give us money, look at me, give us money, come volunteer, look at me, give us money. Would you like to win an iPad? Look at me, give us money. Is that how you meet people to friends? Now, one of the... Um, most cherished moments of last year. Suzanne from Nexus Direct. She's the CEO, and she came and she asked me to take a photo of her group. I never met her. I didn't know many people here. So she invited me to a dinner, the, the US, Canada, North America dinner, and we kind of connected. I don't know a lot about Nexus Direct, except it's a direct marketing agency. So, she never pitched me. She never gave me a business card. She never said, come, we can solve your problems. 
we just developed this relationship. And when we were looking, I'm CMO of a large nonprofit, when we were looking for a direct marketing agency, I put Nexus Direct on the short list because of the relationship. Beth Cantor sitting in the front row. Early on, one of my tactics was to look at a Twitter bio and invite somebody to coffee. And I'd never met Beth before, and we had coffee in Venice with her family. And we became friends, and Beth has been instrumental in helping invisible people grow over the years. I mean, she's given me air miles and helped me with homeless families and just amazing. And it's all because of relationships. And I know we have, we want to do more. We want another van. We want to help more people. We got electric bills to pay and we have all this stuff. But what have we confused getting better with getting bigger? So we're never ever going to have 100% market share. But we're going after everybody. So a little nugget that I love, and it's a tradition from Alcoholics Anonymous, is attraction rather than promotion. Most of the stuff we're doing, is it love, is it fear? It's promotion. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Give us money, give us money, look at me. I mean, have you ever walked up to a stranger you want to build a relationship with and say, hi, would you like to win an iPad? No, but that's what we do. So attraction rather than promotion is really an important nugget in the work we do and where we need to go. And I'm saying that as CMO of a large nonprofit, we're creating our own noise. I sat in my hotel room working with the team back in New York yesterday looking, saying we got so much going on. We have three events, we have multiple campaigns, we're creating our own noise. How many of you are aware of what's happening with ad blocking? They're saying ad blocking will be by 2018 100% adoption. We play a part of that. I mean, it's mostly brands, but we are creating some of that noise. I mean, in the UK, there's conversation now about anti-solicitation. And, you know, there are some very aggressive, and I know nobody in this room, but as a sector, we have to get back to a table and two chairs. One of the first... Um, big marketing jobs in the nonprofit sector I was ever offered I was a VP of a very large nonprofit. And I went in and I met with the CEO and the CEO said, we like what you do, here's the thing, you need to raise money, but you can't ask for money. Oh my gosh, how do you do that? But I love challenges, so I got on the airplane, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it, and it's the only job that before they said, hello, where you're hired, that I actually did a strategy for them. But it was so much in my heart, and I thought about it, is if I ask you for $20, you kind of know me. You might give it to me, you know? Maybe Beth would, maybe you would. But my mom knows me, my close friends, know me very good. They know I need $20 without me asking. And that is the relationships that we need to build. We need to start building relationships for the long run. Now, relationships are work. It's harder. Build an audience. Provide worth. Care about the people and your donors. Think about getting better not just getting bigger. And I know it's hard, and we have all these pressures to raise more money. But if you cultivate an audience and just nurture them and consider them friends, it's going to grow, and you're going to grow. One of the things as I travel, I get lucky to be able to visit places like YouTube and Google. And I don't know how many of you have ever gone to a startup, especially a tech startup. But you'll, I always tweet their coffee kiosks. This is a coffee kiosk at YouTube. And it's literally every 150 feet. And there's drinks and sodas and oranges and granola and bananas. And it's free. And every single startup has this type of coffee kiosk or something that's free. This is our coffee kiosk. 
It's self-funded by us. And we're a large nonprofit, and we don't care any less about people, our employees. We love them just as much. What's the difference? It's the thinking. And what Dan said in earlier today, it's innovation. So we don't think in a startup mentality. Look at Twitter. Twitter changed how the world communicates. Whether you like it or not, whether you tweet or not, it has literally changed how the world communicates. Can you imagine going to a funder and saying, hey, for 140 characters, we're gonna do this thing, give us millions of dollars and let us do a coffee kiosk for our employees. They got the money because they had this startup thinking of, okay, I know it's a risk. Go, change the world. As a sector, we need to start moving to go change the world, make things happen. I leave you with this, and to me, it's so important, we need to share. And I, what's one of the great things about this conference is we are sharing, we're sharing ideas and knowledge. But when, at least in the States, nonprofits are very territorial, they're holding on to stuff like this. And it's common sense because you're often fighting for the same funding, fighting for the same donors. But the world is so big and there's so many crises going on. Not any one charity, not any one nonprofit is gonna solve human trafficking, refugees, breast cancer. We all need to work together. Totally, we need to start sharing, pooling resources. Start thinking of the other charities even in the area. One example I love is Home for Good in Los Angeles. It's taking the faith-based community, the government, the nonprofit sector, and everybody come together to fight homelessness. And not everybody's gonna get along, but if you pool your resources, you're gonna get people off the streets into housing. My last example is House of Miwar, which is a hospitality brand in India that was started in 743 AD. It's been around for seven, eight generations. What's amazing is their three core principles, which is nurture contextual leaders. Meaning, are you thinking about the next generation? The nonprofit I work for in New York is 128 years old. Are we gonna stay around? Are you thinking about that next 100 years? The other is grow your niche, protect it. Find your niche. Again, you're not, we're trying to reach everybody where there's this niche of people that are gonna support you and that's who you need to talk to and make friends. The other one is gift your enemy. So over the years, they've had wars and all kinds of other things that would have changed, but they gifted their enemy. And even currently, other hospitality brands, other hotels come in and they support them because they know their marketing budget's gonna bring in more tourism that's gonna help their hotel brand. So instead of saying, oh my gosh, we have another enemy coming in, they support them and help them. And I think in our sector, we need to start looking at the partners that we have in that particular area, a cause that we're trying to fight and solve as our friends. This has been a marvelous, wonderful experience. I completely am changed, and I left change last year. And I just want to encourage you that, you know, you guys, you're the change makers. You're fueling the change to make our world better. And I, I'm so encouraged by all of you. Let's go change the world.